بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد The author Ibn Al-Qayyim رحمه الله he moves on to discussing what kind of soil and dirt or dust clay uh, is makes up Jannah the dirt the dust the clay what you find on the floor the stones and the structure what it's all made of that's what this chapter is about Imam Ahmed has related this from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu he says that we said Ya Rasulullah whenever we see you our hearts become very soft and we become the people of the Akhirah the people of the hereafter that's what we become however when we come away from you then the dunya the world attracts us and we smell our women and our children essentially we interact with our children and our and our women and it's a different story then so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if you were to be in the same state that you are when you are with me then angels would shake hands with you with their own palms because that's a very special state that you become in when you are with me that's a very special state and the angels would actually come and visit you in your homes however then he said he mentioned the wisdom of sinning and being distracted he said that if you were never to sin, then Allah would bring about a people who would sin so that He could forgive them. This is obviously to comfort people that look, if you do sin, then seek forgiveness. There's a Lord of yours that likes to forgive you. So then they said, uh, Ya Rasulullah, can you tell us about Jannah and what it's made of? So he said, Yes. He said, A brick of gold, a brick of silver. Its mortar will be of musk and its pebbles, its stones will be a lu'lu' wal yaqut. This is pearls and rubies. Wa turabuha az za'afran. And the soil there, the dust, the dirt on the floor is za'afran. Saffron. Whoever enters will be forever happy and will never will never become unhappy. They will remain forever. They will never die. Their clothing will never become worn. Their youthfulness will never disappear. And then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there are three people whose du'as are never rejected. One is the just leader. Anybody who is in a leadership position who is just, because of the blessing of him being just, his du'as are accepted. We've seen... We, we've seen some interesting um, examples of that in the recent past. Right? And the sa'im, the fasting person until he breaks his fast. And the third person is the one who's being oppressed. If he makes a dua. Such duas, they are taken on the clouds. Doors of heaven are opened up for them. And Allah says, by my might, I will assist you. I will assist you, even if it's after a while, but I will assist you. So now you have a number of, I'm not going to go through all of the ahadith. There's numerous ahadith we speak about what the soil and etc. of Jannah is about. But basically he mentions that the soil down there is going to be constituted of za'fran, of saffron. Another hadith uh, which is Related by Abu Naim and others is uh, one gold brick, one silver brick. Its soil is za'fran, and the dirt there is of musk. The dust is of musk. So you have some narrations which say that the soil is za'fran and the dust is musk. And then in some it says the opposite. Essentially, you've got this combination of musk and za'fran. So that's what I don't want to repeat all the narrations to you. There's another narration in Sahih Muslim from Hamad ibn Salama uh, from Abu Sa'id al Khudri. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Ibn Sa'id, Ibn Sa'id, 
there was a man there in Medina Munawwara who was a bit strange. He, would, he could tell things. And there were people who actually thought he was Dajjal at the time as well. He was a bit strange. They used to ask him questions and he used to give you half answers. And answers which seemed to have half the truth in them sometimes. Not the full truth, but half the truth. So the Prophet ﷺ asked him about the, the soil of Jannah. So he said, Darmaka tun bayda. Darmaka is, you know, if you use very fine, soft, refined flour, you know, like really expensive, refined flour, that's what you call darmak. And anything that's like that, like soil that is extremely refined, think of really very refined sand. Darmakatun bayda, it's white. White, soft, refined soil. Miskun khalis. Then he says, Miskun khalis. That's what he said. This uh, Ibn, Sa- Ibn Sa- Sa'id or Ibn Sayyad in another narration it says, It's fine, white, fine, soft soil and pure musk. And Rasulullah said, He's telling the truth. He's telling the truth. Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba has another narration, again from Ibn Sayyad, that he asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the same answer was, was was given about this. There's another narration from Jabir radiallahu anhu. He says that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a man came to him and said, "Ya Muhammad, this is just some kind of reporter." He says, "Ya Muhammad, your companions have been defeated today. They were overwhelmed today, overcome." The Prophet ﷺ said, "Wabi ayy shayin ghuribu." How did they? How were they overcome? He said, "Oh, because the Yahud asked them a question. The the Jewish uh, people there they asked him a question. What is the number of the guardians of Hellfire? How many guardians of Hellfire are there? So they didn't know. It is not something they've seen. So they said, "La nadri hatta nas al nabiyana." We don't know until we ask our Prophet. So this is what the reporter explained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, what's that to do with being overwhelmed? How is that being dominated? أَيُّغْلَبُ قَوْمٌ سُئِلُوا عَمَّا لَا يَعْلَمُونَ فَقَالُوا حَتَّى نَسْأَلْ نَبِيًّا نَسْأَلْ نَبِيًّا He said, how can you say that a people have been overcome if they asked about something that they don't know and their response is that, wait for us to ask our prophets. But these people are, he said, what it is is that these people are the enemy of Allah. They ask their own prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show him self to them openly. Because that's what they said. They said to Musa alayhi salam, we're not going to believe hatta nar Allah jahra until we see Allah himself in his original form. Alayya bi'a'da illah. Bring these enemy of Allah to me. Because I will ask them about the turbatul jannah, about the soil of jannah. And it is very fine and refined. He told them already, he told uh, the, 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 the people around him already. Anyway, when they came, they said, Oh, Abu Qasim, what is the number of guardians of hellfire? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then showed both of his hands like this, and then like that again, and then he put one finger in, which means 19. So he said, 10, and then... 19. So 19. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, What is the soil of Jannah made of? They started looking at each other and they said, Khubzatun ya Abul Qasim. It's like bread flour. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Yes, bread is made out of refined. So I think this may tie in with this Ibn Sayyad story, it seems. Imam Tirmidhi, has, Imam Tirmidhi, Imam Ahmed has uh, related this uh, hadith. So now when you look at all of these narrations together, many of them I didn't mention to you, but it discusses the, the soil and so on. One group of the Salaf said that the soil of Jannah is made up of two things. It's made up of musk and saffron. Made up of musk and saffron. What does that mean? Some say that the soil is from saffron, but when you mix it with water, it becomes like musk. 
meaning the smell that it provides afterwards, it's like, it's because at the end of the day, musk is the smell. You've seen original musk, but there's no beauty in original musk in the sense of uh, looking at it. It's the smell of it that matters. So when you mix this saffron with water, you're going to get the smell of musk. That w that's what he said. That's why he says, Mila tuha al misk. It's mortar. Mortar is generally a mixture to put the bricks together with. Mortar is of musk. That's why in one hadith clearly says, Turabuha zafran wa tinuha al misk. It's sand, it's soil is zafran wa tinuha, but it's clay. The mixture is musk. So that's how you understand it. So when its mixture is going to be so excellent and the water is going to be so excellent and you bring that together, then obviously it's going to come with the best of smells and the best of smells you could explain is musk in those days anyway. And to be honest, musk is a smell that more people like than oud. Although oud, aloes wood is a lot more expensive nowadays than musk is. But musk is a more pleasant smell. That You'd probably find more people that would like musky smell then they would like a oud smell. Only the very refined people understand what musk is. Sorry, what, what uh, oud is. Because initially it has a very fecal kind of smell and, and some people think that somebody's just done something. Uh, you know, when, when it, initially when, when the smell is there, like, is there an animal here or something? Is there dung or something here? But then the smell comes out, which is ajeeb. That's the way it is. Another meaning is that it's zafran in terms of its color. It looks like zafran, you know, bright yellowish. Fiery yellow, that's what zafran looks like. It's this fiery yellow. But then its smell is like that of musk. So that's another way of putting these things together. Ibn Abid Dunya relates this beautiful hadith. It's related from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu through his chain. He says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, Ardul Jannati Bayda. The the land, the ground in Jannah is white. Arsatuha Sukhurul Kafur and its external area, its uh, open yard, its courtyard will be of rocks of camphor. It will be surrounded by misk, by musk, which will be like Kuthban or Ramal, which will be like hills of sand. So there'll be hills of sand that will sand dunes around. They will be musk. That's what it looks like. Fiha anhar, and there are numerous lakes in there that people will go to. fiha ahlul jannah, wa akhirah. And that is where the people of Jannah, from the beginning to the end, all of them will gather by this lake. You know, go to the lakeside, have a barbecue, that kind of an idea. You know, everybody will. They will recognize one another, look at one another get to know one another, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send Rih al a wind of mercy. And فتهيج عليهم ريح المسك That will inspire upon them, that will uh, create this fragrance of musk to come about them. They will get wafts of musk coming past them. Then after that, people will go back home. So a man will go back to his wife and he would have increased in his beauty and his handsomeness and in his fragrance. So he comes back smelling way better and looking much better. So then his maidens will say to him, when you left from me, I was already extremely excited by you, by how you looked and how you smelled. I'm ashaddu ijaban. I'm even more attracted to you now because of how you are now. And this will just be constant every time they go down there. Which sounds to us in this world where we get tired of the same thing. You know, you love a restaurant, you go there, you eat one day. Maybe you'll go the next day as well. But then somebody tells you, third day, come on man, I've had it for two days now. Whereas for that first time, your mouth was watering when you were about to go there the first time. But that's the way of the world. It, it withers immediately. That's why we have to keep buying new things. right? And advertisers know exactly how to get it from us, so they... They indulge our greed. They encourage our senses. They tell you this is decadence. This is soft and beautiful. That's what they tell you. 
that this will make your mouth water and it does make your mouth water then you want to buy it Uh, the, the next uh, chapter, Ibn al-Qayyim deals with what kind of light in Jannah. Where are you going to get light from in Jannah? Is there, because there's supposed to be no sun around there. Sun is a thing of the past. Sun, you know, it's a fiery heat. It's a thing of the past. So what do you get in Jannah? What happens? So here there's a hadith uh, that's related in, by Bazaar and Ibn Adi and others. Says that Ibn Abbas anhu relates that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said Allah has created Jannah white. خلق الله الجنة بيضاء وأحب الزي إلى الله البياض and uh, one of the most beloved garments, appearances and dress to Allah is white. So فليلبسوا أحياءكم your living should wear it and you should also Shroud your dead and your deceased in it. That's where we get the white from. Then, ثم أمر برعاء الشاي فجمعت. Then the Prophet ﷺ ordered that all the shepherds be brought together and gathered, and they were. And the Prophet ﷺ said that من كان ذا غنم سود فليخلط بها بيضا. Anybody who has just black goats or sheep, he should um, uh, mix. Some white with it. So one woman came and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have just black sheep and I don't see that there's any benefit coming about. You know, when he said this, when the Prophet ﷺ said you should have some white sheep as well, she kind of made some connection, it seems. And she said, Look, I've got only black, black and uh, it, I don't see that they, they are, there's any blessing, they, they're not increasing in any way. So he says, Afiri, which means add some white to it. That's why there's another hadith which is related that um, Khalid al Zamil, the son of Simak. So, Simak, uh, he relates from his father Simak that he met Abdullah ibn Abbas in Medina Munawwara in his older age after his uh, eyesight had gone. Abdullah ibn Abbas. So, he said, Ya ibn Abbas, can you tell me about the, the land of paradise? The, the grounds, how it's going to look like. So he said that it's going to be white, uh, like silver, ka'annaha mir'at, like a mirror, sparkling. Kultuma nuruha, where is he going to get this light from? So when he said it's going to be sparkling, so he asked the question, where the, does the light come from? So Ibn Abbas, uh, Ibn Abbas anhu says that you've seen the time just before the sunrise there's no sun right but there's a brightness you know because when you get fajr time essentially what is fajr time fajr time is that the sun is creeping up behind the horizon and it's light indirect light it's essentially indirect light of the sun it hasn't come above the horizon but it sent its light forward then when the sun comes and you get like a bright yellow light and the light at dawn, which is the light of dawn, essentially what we're speaking about. What color is the light of dawn? It's just white. So that's what he said. He says, you know, you know the time before the sun rises? Have you seen that time? فَذَلِكَ نُورُهَا That's going to be like the light of Jannah. Because there's going to be no shams, there's going to be no heat, and there's going to be no extreme cold as well. لَا شَمْسٌ وَلَا زَمْهَرِيرًا Zamharir is extreme cold. And then he mentioned the rest of the hadith. So there is going to be a source of light, but it's going to be an indirect light, it seems. Because everything else will be sparkling. Because you might be thinking, because the question does arise that, you know, that light at dawn time, fajr time light, the late fajr time light, just before sunrise, it's just white light. There's no sparkle in there because there's no sun. The sun provides a yellow in there, right? So what is that going to be all about? Well, you don't need it. You don't need any more than that because everything will have its own shimmer and sparkle because of what, they, what it's made of. So there's intrinsic light within every product out there. So you don't need any other light. Because if you have that bright light, if you have a bright light source in a place that has its own light, what, what happens when you put on an overhead projector? You put down the other lights, right? Otherwise, it causes fade in that picture. 
So everything will have its own sparkle. That's why I, that's my understanding anyway. That's why you don't need this sunlight from outside. It's just so finely tuned like that. So like the, the best light technicians have dealt with this issue, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just created it to give the absolute best appearance. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that the sun and the moon, they're going to be now prevented. They're, they're not going to come around. None of them will be sighted anymore. How are we going to see them? Because in the world we see through the sun or the moon, right? Generally. Just like you see right now in this time of, you know, this was around the sunrise time. This is the way you see the, the you know, you see the, the mountain. This is, you're going to see it like that. So don't worry, you will see. Though there's going to be no sun and moon. Sunan ibn Majah. There's a narration in the Sunan of ibn Majah. Beautiful narration. It says that Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu relates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ala hal mushammirun lil jannah? Is there anybody ready for paradise? Who's prepared for paradise? And then he started describing paradise. He said, paradise, la khatara laha. There is no fear, danger, or anything related to paradise. Here, wa rabbil ka'ba nurun yatala'la. Paradise is a light which is shimmering. It is a light which is shimmering. It is fragrant. It, it is like these beautiful flowers that are just waving. Wa qasrun mashid. These are fortified, <laughs> fortified palaces. Lakes, ripe fruits, ripe fruits, and beautiful and handsome partners, spouses, many, many garments and clothing, and an abode there, a residence there forever in an abode of peace. And also beautiful flowers and fruits. And greenery and bounties in these beautiful shining high palaces they said yes of course ya rasulallah we are all prepared for this so then the prophet said if that is the case inshallah say inshallah if allah wills so the people said inshallah inshallah May Allah make it a reality. May Allah make it a reality. Now to carry on with this discussion, the next discussion logically then is what are its rooms like? What does its actual structure look like? You know, because you see that it's got some structure that's made out of gold and silver bricks. But then there's more to it than that. There will be other dwelling places because it seems like it's an open place. Lots of garden, green, because that's what Jannah means. It's just so lush that it's got rivers and everything flowing through it. But then you're going to have places there that for privacy. So what are these places? So it's almost like you've got this huge garden and within it, you've got these different places you can go and rest in. And they're made of these huge pearls that have been hollowed out. So in this world, pearl are, pearls are very small. They're like, like a chickpea. That's how pearls are, right? Now this is massive. And you'll, you'll see what it says in these narrations. They've been hollowed out and that's what it is. Now pearl has its own shine. If you're any kind of uh, light that hits it, it glimmers. That's what it's made of. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَكِنِ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ لَهُمْ غُرَفٌ مِنْ فَوْقِهَا غُرَفٌ مَبْنِيَّةٌ Surah Az-Zumr that those people who fear their Lord for them are rooms one above the other. We say rooms here, it doesn't talk about small rooms here where we ask, is it a double bedroom or a single bedroom? Right? Can you get one bed in there? Can you get two beds in there? How many people can you sleep in there? This is talking about some serious rooms here. Right? They're fully built. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these are ghurafun fawqa ghuraf. These are rooms one above the other. And they are, they've been made. So that nobody thinks that these are just some metaphorical uh, expressions here. That's why Allah says, Those people, 
will be given as a reward these places of residence because of their patience because of their patience what is the patience the their patience was basically subhanallah we're dealing with it every day somebody saying something about islam or the other somebody abusing muslims somebody saying something weird to muslims you know basically dealing with the foolish on a day-to-day basis sabr that you still keep your faith despite this because there are so many people who get tired of this says what's the point of being a muslim we're like the the underdogs here we're the ones constantly being criticized reviled sworn at and cursed but no you still keep a pride right because you know that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's test is to you so Allah subhanahu wa that's why you get this because of the sabr and the perseverance that they have Allah says وَمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُكُمْ بِالَّتِي تُقَرِّبُكُمْ عِنْدَنَا زُلْفَا إِلَّا مَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ جَزَاءُ الدِّعْفِ بِمَا عَمِلُوا وَهُمْ فِي الْغُرُفَاتِ آمِنُونَ They will be safe in these rooms. He speaks about these ghurfa, ghuraf, which is these places of residence. That's why Allah, that's in Saba, Surah Al-Saba. Then Allah says in Surah Al-Tahreem, يَغْفِلْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Allah will forgive you your sins. وَيُدْخِلْكُمْ jannat And enter you into gardens تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا anhar Beneath which rivers flow. Now you know, whenever you read the Quran, جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا anhar تَحْتِهَا anhar Anhar means nahar, means a river. Under which rivers flow. وَمَسَاكِنَ الطَّيِّبَةٍ and these excellent places of residence, excellent places of abode, fi jannati adan, in these, uh, in these, uh, in this paradise. And that's why the wife of Pharaoh mentions, uh, makes a dua in the Quran, Surah to tahrim uh, Actually, the first, the second verse that I read was Surah to Saf. This one is from Surah Tahrim. Rabbi binili inda kabeitan fil jannah. My Lord, make for me a house in paradise. So Imam Tirmidhi has related from Sa'id ibn, uh, from Ali radiallahu anhu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that in paradise there will be residences, places of residences, rooms you call them, right? apartments. Yura dhuhuruha min butuniha. Its outside can be sighted from the inside and its outside can be seen from the inside. Faqama a'rabi. So this desert Arab Bedouin got up and he said, Ya Rasulullah, liman here? Who are these for? So the Prophet ﷺ then explained who these are for. He says, liman tayyib al-kalam. For the one who does excellent speech, who always keeps his speech excellent, who's not derogatory, who's not vulgar, who's not filthy, who's always very beautiful in his speech. Wa at'am al-ta'am. And who feeds, who feeds, who likes to give food to people. So you can see this is a very charitable individual. Both in terms of his hands and also in terms of his tongue. Wa adam as For himself, he is perpetually fasting. He's fasting. Wa salla bil layl. Wa nasu niyam. Prays at night while others are asleep. That's for such person, these beautiful homes will be in paradise. Numerous other narrations. I'm going to read uh, one more, one other narration here from Sahih Muslim and Bukhari and Muslim, from Abu Musa al-Ashari radiyallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "For the believer in paradise will be a khayma. Khayma is generally a tent. Now this is going to be some super luxury tent, not your normal like you know plastic tent or something. This is going to be some serious tent. You know, even Qaddafi used to live in a tent, but it was like a royal tent." So this is going to be Jannah, a tent of Jannah. What is it going to be made of? Min lu'atin wahidatin mujawwafatin. One single hollowed out pearl. Imagine the size of this. Tuluha sittuna milan. Now if you think it's just gonna, you know, we're talking about how many people it sleeps, right? Because you know, if you go to buy a tent, it tells you sleeps four, sleeps six, sleeps eight maybe maximum, right? This one, tuluha sittuna milan. 60 miles long 60 miles long and what is it it doesn't come just like an empty tent it comes with everything inside it because you know this is talking about 
like five, more than five star we're talking about here, right? لِلْمُؤْمِنِ فِيهَا أَهْلُونَ يَتُوفُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمُؤْمِنِ And for the believer will be an, a family in there. Ahl, meaning wives, spouses in there. فَلَا يُرَى بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا But there'll be so many, but it looks like they will all have their own enclosures. So each one of them will not see the other. So he can go to whichever one he wants. And the Prophet ﷺ said in a Sahih narration that whoever builds a masjid for Allah, Allah builds him a house in paradise. Now do you, do you suddenly see the house in paradise, the value of that house in paradise? Because you know generally when we say house, we think of house here, right? We say, okay, it's good. Right? Having another house is good. But here, once you've described a house, now you understand what the benefit of your donation is to the masjid. Who builds a masjid for Allah, Allah builds him that kind of a house in paradise. Abu Musa, there's another narration. It says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the person who praises Allah and who says, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah at, his, at the death of his child. You know, like somebody, somebody's child passed away. So the person said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Right? Who dealt with it in the right way. Doesn't freak out. Right? Allah will say, Make for my servant, Ibn Uli Abdi Baytan fil Jannah, make for my servant a house in paradise and was Sammuhu Bayt al Hamd. Call it, give it the name Bayt al Hamd, the house of praise, because he has praised me. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. There's a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim from Abu Huraira and Ab uh, Abdullah ibn Abi Awfa. And Aisha radiallahu anha, that Jibreel alayhi salam once came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that, you know, Khadija, give her salam from, my, from her Lord and tell her that he gives her the glad tidings of a house in Jannah made of Qasab. Now, Qasab means... In the world, Qasab means cane. Because you know, cane are those round sticks that are hollowed in the middle. They're very good for building. But the Qasab in Jannah is different. He just used that word because he said, La sakhab fihi wa la nasab. That his house will be made of Qasab. There'll be no sakhab or nasab. Sakhab means there'll be no wailing and crying and loud noise. Wala nasab and there'll be no difficulty. So I think he just used the word qasab for that reason. And the other thing is that because it's hollow. He said because the qasab here relates to hollowed out pearl. That's the house that she will get. And she's already given, been given the glad tidings. She's been given a certificate for it. She has the deed for it basically. <coughs> Ibn Abid Dunya relates. From Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that in Jannah there will be a palace made out of pearl. And... There'll be no headache, nothing that you will experience in there. It'll be just a beautiful place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this specially for his Khalil Ibrahim alayhi salam. There's numerous other narrations about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi seeing the house of Umar radiallahu an, which we've read before. Right? A'mash relates from... In, with his chain, he says that in Jannah there will be palaces made out of gold, palaces made out of silver, and palaces made out of pearl. So these are different ones. Also, palaces made out of ruby, palaces made out of sapphire. So you take your pick basically. You know, you have a summer palace, and you have a winter palace, and you have this palace and that palace. It's just like that. Some people have a holiday home, you know, some people have this home, that home. And when you get kings, they have one palace in this country, one in this country, in this country, that place, this palace. So here you've got numerous palaces. And I don't think that you have to worry about, hey, bring my laptop from that one. You know, bring this from that one, carry everything over. You'll have the facility wherever you go. It'll all be like so well, smartly connected that you are just, wherever you are, you, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to carry anything with you. And subhanAllah, the world is going in that direction to show us what the, all of these things, how simple they're going to be in the hereafter. 
Because that's where the world is getting, isn't it now? That's why Amish has another narration. He says, the lowest person in Jannah will have a residence made out of a single pearl. And from it will be made its rooms and its doors. This is the understanding of these tabi'een. That this is what they've understood from these narrations. And we're talking about people carving from mountains. This is talking about a massive pearl and then all of this is being carved out, carved out of that. <coughs> Ibn al-Qayyim mentions this other narration from the fawaid of Ibn al-Sammak. He says that it's related from Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said should I tell you about the residences of Jannah? Of course ya Rasulullah our mothers and fathers be sacrificed for you. So then he said in Jannah there will be residences made out of all different types of jewels so you, there, that's where you get your made out of um, your sapphire and ruby and all these other precious stones and it will be such that it will be made in such a way that the outside can be seen from the inside but the in and the inside from the outside but there'll still be privacy this is just so that you don't have to go inside to see it you can see it from outside for yourself In it will be Naim Walladat Mala Ainun Ra'at Wala Udunun Samiat. And in there will be such bounties and pleasures that no eye has ever seen or no ear has ever heard of. So then they said, Ya Rasulullah, who's gonna get these? Who are these for? So then the Prophet explained and subhanAllah, may Allah give us a tawfiq for these actions. He says, Liman Afsha Salam for the one who spreads the salam. Who feeds the who feeds, who likes to feed food. Right. Give food, who fasts regularly, and who prays at night when people are sleeping. So then they, we said, Ya Rasulullah, who can do all of this? So he said, My Ummah can do this. Who can do all of this? He said, My Ummah can do this, and let me tell you about this. So then he explained, and this is the beautiful part here. He then explained how you can do all of these things. Right. He says, when any of you meets his brother on the street or wherever, for salam alayhi, he does salam to him, or re responds to him salam, faqad afsha salam, he has spread the salam. It doesn't mean you have to go and like start spreading salam like salam 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 salam. Hey salam 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 salam. You know it's not like that. It's like you meet somebody, you say salam alaykum, you respond. So essentially, you keep that interaction, that greeting has to be salam every time you meet somebody. That's not difficult, is it? Unless you're arrogant, it's easy to do. Why should it be a problem? So every time you don't feel like giving somebody salam, just think I'm losing my chance for paradise here. He said, just think of it that way. Then he says, now about feeding food. Look how simple the Prophet makes it. He said, the one who feeds his family, his wife and children, until they are satisfied, then he has fed, he, had, he has fulfilled this. At'am at ta'am. Now, it sounds like, you know, you're going to have to give big dawats when you first read it. It's like you have to have these big, big uh, invitations where you feed huge amounts of people. That's what you think first. And you have to be just peppering everything with salam, salam, salam everywhere, right? But no, look, the Prophet made it so easy. He said, just make salam to everybody you meet. And just feed your own family properly. And whoever fasts Ramadan, and then three days from every month, then he has perpetually fasted. Again, this is making it simple. Right? And the praying at night. Now, most of us will be thinking this is talking about tahajjud. And no doubt, it definitely refers to tahajjud because most people are asleep at tahajjud time. Right? But this one he says, and the ones who pray Salatul Isha in Jama'ah. That means he has performed prayer at night while people are sleeping. And who are we talking about? People of other faiths who don't stay awake to that time to pray. 
Now I know we live in different times where we have so much artificial light sources that people sleep very late and so on. But here it's obviously speaking about people who are not there for the worship of Allah but they are indulging in something else. That is beautiful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq because that's easy to do. So the next time you don't feel like doing it. Now the only thing, see, see because we generally give salam to people. Most, a lot of people they give salam to each other. Feeding your family. And number three was the fasting. So we've done Ramadan, now it's just about adding three days. It's not much really, it's not much really. Adding three days and then praying Isha in the masjid. Those are the two things which are, we, we need to do. Allah make it easy for us. And then you can say on this day, the 27th of July, what is the Islamic date today? The, twi the, the 21st of Ramadan. Sorry, the 21st of Shawwal. Right? We heard this hadith. This is what was explained. So this is what we've been doing. Where's, where's our special places in Jannah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi.